So uh, let's uh, get things underway. Um, we're delighted that uh, we've managed to uh, secure Dr. Phil Hammond as our opening keynote speaker for today. Um, Phil is a, a doctor, a, a journalist. He's a broadcaster now with his own uh, BBC Radio 4 series. He's a campaigner. He's a comedian. Um, he qualified as a GP in 1991, uh, and he currently works in a specialised NHS centre. Now, throughout this COVID lockdown, Phil has appeared through my letterbox every two weeks, uh, not to give me medical advice, but he's the Private Eye's medical correspondent. And he's been that since 1992. His, his pragmatic and, and objective commentary on the pandemic has been a, a welcome relief from the confusing and contradictory messages from politicians, the press and social media. He campaigns for patient empowerment. He campaigns for open data in healthcare and for the NHS to be honest and transparent about the harm it causes as well as the good that it does. So I'm going to hand over now to uh, uh, to Phil, who will take us through our opening session this morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, particularly Douglas, for inviting me. Uh, hello, gorgeous, lovely health and safety people. Um, I'm Dr Phil Hammond. I've worked in the NHS now for 34 years. Um, and rather alarmingly, I would say, we don't have a terribly good health and safety record for a national health service. Uh, and I could probably learn an awful lot from you uh, about how we should manage health better. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about health risks, um, how we can avoid the NHS, so our individual health risks, and then institutional health risks, how the NHS tries to manage and mitigate risk, uh, and how we've struggled through this pandemic, the hits and misses of the pandemic. Uh, but I'd like to kick off by playing homage to my Auntie Queenie. Uh, here is Auntie Queenie. <clears throat> You might uh, hear the old Australian twang in my voice because Auntie Queenie uh, was Australian and I was brought up in Australia and she was great for the sayings. She used to say, Philip, the moment your sperm meets your egg, you join the queue for death. Uh, now, that might seem slightly pessimistic, but it gets risk in perspective that our mortality rate is 100 percent and always will be. So the challenge we face as humans, the... Uh, eight billion or so hairy assed primates living on this planet is what we do when we're queuing for death. How can we live a life of joy and meaning and purpose and not be taken off at half time, not bow out too early? I would argue actually that one of the best ways of saving the NHS is trying not to use it. Um, there's a, we know that healthcare is incredibly expensive, you all know that, uh, and that the general theory, the general philosophy is trying to move towards prevention and we, if we can. So instead of pulling people out of the river of illness, uh, we try to wander upstream uh, and stop them falling in in the first place. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about your own health. I noticed many of you, uh, when you were joining, you joined with your cameras on and you looked actually in pretty good nick. Most of you, there weren't too many uh, looking jaundiced or hideously overweight. Uh, but it's a tough old life out there and managing your risks over a lifetime is really hard. Uh, I think the secret to start off with is um, learning how to pleasure yourself properly. Uh, that might sound faintly disgusting. Oh, look, there's a stern face just joining. Hello, oh, Pamela. Hello. Lovely to see you. How are you, Pamela? Are you well? Yeah, fine, thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. I'll turn the camera off now, so it's not so soon. Yeah. The mic's on and the camera's on. So look, there's a, somebody's headline. The mic's on and the camera's on. Somebody's headline's on. Okay, so let's turn this. I did one of these at Christmas. I did one of these at Christmas. People left their mics on. People left their mics on. Who is that who's still got Who is that who's still got it? Oh, is it? No, hang on. No, we've gone. Well done, James. I did one of these at Christmas and somebody paid uh, Shaking Stevens Christmas hits all the way through with their microphone open, which was a bit of a challenge. So, yes, I'm going to start off uh, by thinking about our own risks. How many people here? I don't know if we've got a thumbs up sign. How many people here think that they know how to pleasure themselves properly already? They've had a life in health and safety. They're absolutely certain they know how to pleasure themselves. James, bless him, has still got his camera on. So I can see James is very adept at pleasuring himself. Um, it's really interesting, isn't it? What, how do we manage our own risk? We work in an industry where uh, we're very driven by data and protocols, but we still need to how to learn to pleasure ourselves sensibly. So I'd like you all uh, to say you can keep your microphones off or you can turn them on. It's entirely up to you. I'd like you to take Dr. Phil's pleasure pledge and repeat after me. I pledge to pleasure myself in a safe and sustainable way. James is going to lead it. James Pomeroy, I pledge. I pledge. 
To pleasure myself. To pleasure myself. In a safe and sustainable way. In a safe and sustainable way, Phil. A big round of applause there for James. Uh, so how do you do it? How do you pleasure yourself in a safe and sustainable way? Uh, it actually doesn't involve going anywhere near a doctor. If you're a man, uh, and James may demonstrate this, very healthy, very simple way of deciding whether you've been overdoing the pleasure or the work-related stress. Very simple test that men can do, preferably in private. Um, a healthy man looks about 30 years younger than his scrotum. So very simple test now. If you want to, you can get the little fellas out or you can wait until later. If you look roughly the same age as your scrotum, you're overdoing the stress, you're overdoing the pleasure. If you can't actually see your scrotum, you might have type 2 diabetes. So very simple test that we can all do now or we can wait until later. Taking it slightly more seriously, what are the fundamentals of health? So if we're thinking about what does the human mind and body need to remain healthy, to reduce our risk of chronic disease, reduce our risk of needing to use uh, the NHS, uh, I teach using the clangers. Anyone remember the clangers, James? Uh, James, big fan of the clangers. The clangers... I had uh, clangers wallpaper when I was a kid. Oh, right. I love that. They're all joining in now. This is good, isn't it? Now, the clangers, first ever children's colour TV programme. You ever stuck in a pub quiz? Uh, they were the brainchild of two old socialists, Oliver Postgate and Peter Furman. Uh, and they uh, lived in their garden shed, basically. They came up with Nog in the Nog, Ivor the Engine, Bagpuss and the Clangers. And the Clangers were my favourite because we just about landed on the moon. Uh, and uh, they came up with this idea of these essentially moon mice. They lived on a blue planet, but they were always outdoors. They didn't care what they looked like. They were all clangish shaped. They wore homemade clothes. There was no stress there because there was no internet. There was no constant comparison. There was no social media. There was no fear of missing out. They lived outdoors. They had a nutritious diet of soup from the soup dragon and blue string pudding. Not on uh, they experimented. This was a nice thing. They experimented. They openly made mistakes. They would drop clangers. They would learn from their mistakes. And most episodes would end with a hug, if you remember. So it was also a culture built on compassion. And we know compassion is very good for health. Now, I now work in paediatrics. I work in a specialist paediatric unit for young people with ME, CFS, <clears throat> long COVID, post-viral fatigue. And in trying to explain the basics of uh, the daily pillars of health to children, I use CLANG as, as an acronym of how to live like a CLANGER. Now, this is genius. I'm going to send Douglas a card with this on, so you don't need to write it down. But CLANGERS stands for connect, learn, be active, notice, give back, eat well, relax, sleep. Connect, learn, be active, notice, give back, eat well, relax, sleep. Your turn, James. You see, it's also a dementia screening test. We've caught. James. Yeah, I've clearly failed that, Phil, <laughs> very early on. Attentive listening. Say first is that the fundamental, I think, for all our health is connection. It's interesting, isn't it? We would love to meet in person if we could. We'd love to shake hands and tell stories and share concerns and, uh, and expertise. And that's what we normally do at these conferences. And they are slightly odd doing them at a distance. I think we still can. I think there's opportunity for chat. But in essence, humans are social animals. We're part of the health and safety community. Um, Douglas. Uh, Lloyd and Lloyds have got us together today and we're leaves on that tree today, but we're also part of families and communities and sports groups and running groups and churches and all sorts of things that are fundamental to human existence. And we know the flip side of that, that isolation is really bad for your health. It's very high risk. They think that social isolation and loneliness may be as risky as 10 to 15 cigarettes a day. And we also know in the pandemic, a lot of people who had pre-existing health conditions have been forced to isolate. And that's made their health even worse. Uh, and one of the good things about the pandemic is it's it's almost rekindled compassion within societies. So a lot of big companies do corporate uh, charity work and a lot of people within their communities have checked out on people who were struggling and uh, made sure people are OK. Just having that basic sense of human connection, someone looking out for you is really important. The other thing I would say that's slightly American now, I have a very simple view of healthcare. I think healthcare begins with self care, and self care begins with uh, self love and self compassion. Uh, so, here's if you have a little think to yourself how many people here would say that they love themselves? Uh, do you love yourself, James? In moderation, Phil. In moderation. Do you? Okay, so you do it regularly, but in moderation. That's good. Because it's not terribly British saying you love yourself, it sounds a bit American. How many people here quite like their own company? Have a think about that, James. I think like many people, we enjoy the company of others, but then also appear oh, kind of like solitude at times so and periods of reflection. You can disappear inside your own head and not mind what you find there. In moderation. Okay. 
could you get through an entire evening on your own without three bottles of wine and Netflix? <laughs> Um, well, yes, probably not. No. So, I mean, there you go. It's a tough old ask, isn't it? But actually, self-compassion, uh, a lot of mental illness is rooted in self-anxiety and not liking yourself. Uh, and I think one of the issues in working in high stress industries, I mean, we work in the NHS, where for gosh, since 2000, we've had this organisation called the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. Nice. It's now called the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence. And after various scandals, particularly the Bristol Heart scandal that I was involved in exposing in private eye, we came up with this idea of nice to set the standards that the NHS should aspire to for the management of various conditions and a care quality commission to wander around and check that we're meeting those standards. The trouble is, for a health service, the, uh, the health plays pretty scant regard, I would say, to health and safety. Uh, we have about 100,000 vacancies in the NHS and in social care. And people always say, oh, why can't the NHS be like the airline industry? Why can't we have a black box? Why can't we have mandatory speaking up when things go wrong? But in essence, if aeroplanes were staffed to the level that the NHS is, they would never take off. The NHS is like a great big aeroplane with a hole in the fuselage, half the wing missing, three members of crew down, and yet still has to take off every day. So that's the big stumbling block. We have really interesting systems uh, and we have things like safe surgery checklists uh, and lot data reporting systems. But if you don't have enough bodies on the ground for what is essentially uh, a human endeavour, yes, robots can do prostate surgery, but they can't deliver babies yet, etc. Uh, then you're really struggling uh, to provide a, a safe and sustainable service. So the second batch of clangers, the L of clangers is learning. We know that if you wanted to invest in anything to improve the health of the nation, you'd probably invest in education uh, before you invested in um, health. There's a very strong link between people's education and their future health. So if you get kids off to a sure start, you bring them up with compassion, uh, you don't treat them with cruelty, and then they get a good education. Generally, that sets them off better than anything in terms of their future life chances and their future health chances. So learning is good. I learned a lot from Auntie Queenie. Here she is again. Another of Auntie Queenie's favourite atherisms. She used to go, Philip, variety is the spice of life. Philip, moderation in all things. Healthy mind, healthy body. Full up. Always take time to smell the roses. Full up. Long and thin goes too far in. Short and thick does the trick. Go, I no idea what you're talking about, Auntie Queenie. I'm only seven. I'm only seven. But remember the wisdom of elders. You know, those old aphorisms, moderation in all things and variety of the spice of life pretty much covers most health bases. Uh, most of the illnesses, the chronic diseases that are making us get sick earlier in life are largely down to overindulgence or failing to pleasure ourselves sensibly or in many cases people who feel that they have futile lives so we talk about diseases of despair uh, rather rudely uh, gps often say when they work in very deprived areas people suffer from uh, uh, shit life syndrome and it sounds pretty pejorative but actually what it's saying is that if you have no job no house no garden no future no self-esteem no reason to live you're unlikely to pop down to waitrose for your pun of sun-dried tomatoes and your oily fish uh, and the, you have to give people hope and expectation uh, if you want them to um, have a reason to live and to be healthy so listening to Boris Johnson yesterday you sort of half believe yes you want a, a, a high wage high skill economy but we're a long way from getting that at the moment and I think the interesting thing about the UK I mean Johnson said this again almost with an extraordinary brass neck that we have uh, huge inequalities in the UK and uh, very uh, uh, unfair wealth distribution. Well, his party has been in power for 11 years, so perhaps they had something to do there. But we sort of the point is that we tolerate a lot of harm in this country. So we tolerate the fact that the richest people have 20 more years of disease free living and 10 more years of life expectancy than the poorest. You know, as a political class, we tolerate that. We've tolerated the fact that we've had almost 150,000 COVID deaths, when if we'd risk managed it better, we could have had far fewer. So there's something interesting about the British way. We don't, we don't really aspire to excellence, and sometimes we don't have the resources to do it. So when NICE was first formed uh, in the NHS, I argued we also need NIGE, the National Institute for Good Enough. Because uh, there are some days in the NHS where you're several members of staff down and you're flooded in the emergency department and good enough, i.e. getting over the safety bar, 
is what you should be aiming at. And on a really good day, when you're fully staffed and you can manage the workload, you might manage clinical excellence, but you need that bare minimum. So I would argue there's a safety bar and there's a quality bar and you always got to get over the safety bar, but you may not always reach the quality bar. Don't beat yourself up if you don't. You're always aspiring to incrementally improve. But it's interesting in healthcare. That there was a study recently that uh, just came out yesterday that said that GPs are missing a large number of red flag cancer symptoms. Uh, and you'll notice at the moment that GPs are now the fall guys for everything that's going wrong with the NHS. So uh, Matt Hancock, who you may remember was health secretary before somebody put a digital camera in his office and he was filmed breaching social distancing rules. And we don't need to go into that in too much detail, but that was an interesting digital innovation. Uh, but while he was health secretary and during the pandemic, he argued we should use technology to improve efficiency and safety in the NHS by making 85% uh, of initial encounters through the digital front door. So he was very keen on saying, actually, face to face consultations, they take up time and petrol and travel. And actually, now we've used the pandemic. People are used to video and phone consultations that should constitute 85% of consultations. So GPs dutifully switched to this model and are absolutely hung out to dry by the Daily Mail and the Daily Telegraph because people want old style, face to face, hand holding, arm around the shoulders, consultations with GPs. But the whole model, I would say, in general practice is unsafe and unsustainable. So picture this, you have a 10 minute consultation. Uh, you have a lady of 87 in the waiting room who is both breathless and bereaved. So she's lost her husband to COVID. She's living on her own. She's come down because she's lonely, but she's also suffering from breathlessness. Uh, you've got a 10 minute consultation to get her with her breathlessness from the waiting room into the consulting room takes about three minutes. So your 10 minute consultation is now down to seven minutes. She wants a hug and she wants to talk about her bereavement. You're worried about missing a red flag symptom of breathlessness in case it's something more serious. And to do that, you're probably going to need to undress and examine her, which will probably take another five minutes. So if you think about all the risks that we have to manage in a 10 minute consultation in general practice, it's hugely high risk. Uh, the other difficulty is that serious conditions such as cancer often present in a slightly nuanced way in the earlier stages. So some people have clearly red flag symptoms. They have a big lump somewhere or they're peeing or they're pooing blood or they're coughing it up and you can say, yes, that's a red flag symptom. We're going to refer you to a two week wait cancer service where the wait's actually maybe three months now because we're overloaded. But some develop in very subtle ways, a bit of pain, a bit of fatigue. Things could, could be other things. So hanging GPs out to dry when we're short of five or ten thousand frontline GPs will just make them not want to do the job or make them want to do it part time. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy if we criticise a particular group of health workers. So there's a lot of subtle learning to be done in uh, um, medicine and healthcare. Connect, learn, be active. This is really interesting. People often say if we could invent any drug that had the same benefits of exercise uh, for mind and body, we'd all be billionaires. And yet most of us in our busy days struggle to do 30 minutes of aerobic exercise every day. There are lots of ways that you can manage this. Uh, uh, things like uh, park runs are a fabulous idea where you all get together as a group and you do this, doing it as an industry or a neighborhood where you do a run together. I play five a side football once a week very badly. And I'm known as Chopper after the legendary Chelsea uh, fullback Chopper Harris, who used to take people down. I'm a bit clumsy, but I get 20,000 steps in the day that I play football uh, and I have dogs. I'm actually a big fan of dogs. I, I have a theory if we could prescribe dogs on the NHS as well as drugs, uh, we would probably massively reduce risk and improve the health of the nation. The evidence for dogs actually is huge. If you uh, hug a dog, uh, it reduces your blood pressure. Fact. Uh, they also reduce your cholesterol uh, by eating your food. Uh, they look at you. A dog looks at you. Your husband doesn't look at you. Your wife doesn't look at you. Your doctor doesn't look at you. Uh, a, uh, a dog will look at you and keep looking at you until you take it out for a walk. So automatically you're outdoors. You're not stuck in some sweaty, soulless gym. You've got blue sky. You've got green fields. Every other dog walker you meet, well, most of the dog walkers you meet are friends. So you've got a social circle. Dogs keep you subtle, supple as you bend over to pick up the poo. Uh, and if you're too depressed to put your pants on in the morning, they'll lick your testicles. You don't get that of the doctors, do you? Uh, it doesn't have to be a dog. You might have a cat. Uh, you might just have a pot plant. They did an extraordinary study in care homes uh, where they gave half a care home, people in a care home, a pot plant to look after. And the very act of having something to care for and to look after 
dramatically improved people's psychological health and their other health outcomes. Uh, we used to talk about, is this a psychological problem? Is it a physical problem? Uh, in fact, there is no illness out there that is either purely psychological or purely physical. You know, every physical illness has psychological consequences. Every psychological illness has physical consequences. The only way you can separate the two is if you decapitate someone, which is generally uh, lethal. Uh, so everything we do, it, it, taking a holistic pro approach to health risk is absolutely vital. It's interesting, people with mental health issues have higher death rates from physical health issues such as heart attacks. And that may be because people attribute their physical signs to their mental illness or that they struggle to be heard or to seek help and when they're also suffering from mental illness at the same time. So let's be holistic. Let's not divide things into physical uh, and uh, psychological risks, but treat the whole body holistically. I think that's really important. So connect, learn, be active, notice. Uh, you've probably noticed there's an awful lot of books about mindfulness at the moment. Um, lots of mindfulness, headspace type apps. I think the advantage uh, of mindfulness is it, it teaches us that your brain can only hold so much information at one time. And if you fill it up with the beauty of the world around you, you fill up your senses with a beautiful view or you just go outside, leave your phone behind and be still for 15 minutes. You fill up your brain with sensation without having to risk manage it, without having to judge it. And it can actually push fatigue, anxiety, pain and other symptoms to one side. So. The noticing bit, if you don't like meditation, you don't like going, um, you don't like listening to slightly peculiar American voices um, uh, telling you how to relax, just go outside into green space uh, without your phone and just be still. Isn't that amazing? Everybody's now on mute and uh, the sound of silence uh, from Simon and Garfunkel onwards is actually... <laughs> oh, look, he's off again. It's James off again. Look, James is off again. How are you doing, James? I'm very good. I was reflecting on your thoughts, Phil, about uh, how to get to a point of reflection, whether it's walking or calmness. In my case, just going for a run takes my mind to a different place. Well, that's really interesting. So running too. I mean, some people, when they run for a long time, they get the uh, the knees and the back complaining, in which case switch to walking. It's really interesting. I Walking cures. I talk about the walking cure. Most people, clearly not everyone, but most people can walk. And there are very few things we do that are as advantageous for walking. So walking outdoors where you are connecting with the world around you, the beauty around you, you're walking at a pace that makes you slightly uh, breathless, but without making your lips blue. Um, unbelievably good for you. Uh, and just about everyone can do it. Um, so if you're stuck and you're stressed and actually a lot of companies, even in COVID, have switched to holding meetings outdoors. Now, if you hold a meeting outdoor, it's really interesting because you can stay side by side with someone. You have a little chat and then you sort of pull off and have a bit of private time thinking and then you move up again and have a chat. There was a great Australian study that found that if you can walk five kilometres an hour minimum, it drastically reduces your chances of premature death. So walking speed is really interesting. It, the, the Australian researcher said it appears that at five kilometres an hour, you outpace the Grim Reaper, uh, which is a nice thought. And also in COVID, we got COVID slightly wrong because we did this thing saying you should only go outdoors once a day for an hour, which is complete nonsense. Outdoors is incredibly safe in terms of respiratory virus because the wind blows. So people actually should have been told stay inside or exercise outdoors, keep walking outdoors. We could have dramatically improved the cardiovascular fitness of the nation and probably reduced your chances of death if you get COVID. So if in doubt, you're not sure what to do, walk. Stop taking the tube, clearly high risk or whatever, public transport if you can, and take an extra 10 or 15 minutes to walk. Doesn't have to be 10,000 steps a day. That was just built into the, the marketing people of Fitbit to make you feel anxious. Uh, so you you walk at a sort of a, an amount you can do and uh, don't push your heart rate too high. I'm not a huge fan of high intensity training because uh, uh, people of a certain age over their 50 can throw off a little bit of a clot and have a stroke or whatever. So I'm not, you know, some people do fine. If you're still running marathons at 80, whatever, I take my hat off to you. But be a little bit wary once you get over 50. Push yourself to the point of exhaustion. You may get away with it, but there's also a slight risk. You may trip into a heart dysrhythmia or a stroke. So generally exercise at a reasonable level. It isn't taking your pulse much above 150 uh, would be my exercise. Connect, learn, be active. Notice giving back. Here we go. Um, happy people are compassionate people. Uh, that's the reason I work in health and care. As, as a bloke, it's actually quite good to sit down and do a consultation where you're trying to help people as best you can, because not all jobs do that. A lot of jobs are target and profit driven, but not always very compassionate. 
And of course, compassion doesn't have to involve money or work. Um, a friend of mine uh, went up to the Intercontinental Hotel in Glasgow, uh, where he was staying. It's a true story. And he was in the restaurant. And as he was in the restaurant, he saw this chap coming down uh, to uh, talk to the head waiter. And this bloke said, look, I've been coming up to this restaurant, uh, coming up to this hotel three or four times now because I bring my son up for chemotherapy at the big hospital over the road. And he's had three cycles of it and it's not really worked. Uh, and we're just going to try a final cycle. And he absolutely hates the chemo. He hates the drugs. He hates the needles. He hates the sickness. Uh, he just, you know, he's not a fan of it. So he hates not having any hair. So in sympathy with him, I've decided that I'm going to shave my head tonight because he hasn't got any hair. Uh, and I just want to warn everyone because we're going to look a bit odd when we walk into breakfast. And the head waiter said, oh, no, that's fine. My mate said as he came down to breakfast the next morning, he walked down and as the dad and the son came down the stairs, bald as coots, they looked around them and every single waiter had shaved his head. Now, these are probably Eastern European waiters below the minimal wage who didn't really know this couple from Adam other than they ate in the restaurant and they spontaneously widened their circle of compassion. And it's a good thing to do. It uh, fundamentally is good for our health compassion. And that's one of the good things to come out of this pandemic and we need to keep it going. Connect, learn, be active, notice, give back, eat well. How many people here think they eat well? James, do you eat well? I try. I fail probably uh, every other day, I think. But I, there is a, an attempt. If you look at the data, the data is really confusing. We try to eat well, but the Japanese eat less fat than us and have fewer heart attacks. The French eat more fat than us and have fewer heart attacks. The Japanese drink less red wine than us and have fewer heart attacks. The French drink more red wine than us and have fewer heart attacks. In fact, you can eat and drink what you like. It's speaking English that kills you. It is absolute nonsense. Of all the nonsense I've told you, that's the biggest. As uh, my Auntie Queenie used to say, where is she? Here's Auntie Queenie. Look, she used to go, full up. if in doubt, don't put it in your mouth. Now, that works in a number of social situations, but it's particularly good with eating because we massively overeat. So my consultant used to say that a portion should fit in your cupped hands. If you want to know what a portion size is, Turn your plate over and eat on the underside, the small circle. The gravy goes everywhere, but that's a kind of portion. We go everywhere and we have massive supersized portions. Also, the food we eat is important. They say you should eat a Mediterranean diet uh, to reduce your risks of just about everything. The reason they say that is that they like going to Mediterranean countries to do their research. But actually, a Mediterranean diet has variety. It has a variety of different fruit and veg and nuts and seeds and virgin olive oil and sustainable fish and a bit of red meat if you want that, a bit of dark chocolate, a bit of red wine. What the human body seems to like is variety. And what you're feeding is not just your own mind and body, but the trillions of bugs in your gut, which are known as your microbiome. And then research suggests they're as important to your health, to your immunity, to your well-being as the rest of you. Uh, we know they're important because we've done really interesting research. So, for example, they've taken the, the microbiome, essentially the poo, they've taken the poo out of obese mice and put it into thin mice and it makes the thin mice obese. They've taken the poo out of anxious mice and they've put it into happy mice and it's made the happy mice anxious. Now, you could argue that having a strange mouse's poo shoved up, you could make you a bit anxious. There, there could be a confounding variable here, or it could be that actually key messages are carried in the bugs in your gut. We've sort because of COVID, we've sort of created a whole germophobic nation where we think that all bugs are bad. The vast majority of microbiome of our microbiome are symbiotic bugs. They live with us in harmony and they're essential to our health. So let's not cut out all bugs completely because most of them um, we actually need. So diet is really important. Uh, Auntie Queenie was married to Uncle Ron. So here is my Uncle Ron, who's a bit of a star. Now, Uncle Ron didn't do much with his life, but was actually one of the happiest blokes I ever met. So there's a bit of a lesson there. He used to sit, when I used to visit him, he'd sit on the veranda in West Leaderville in Perth uh, and just stare at the view. And I'd say, what are we doing today, Uncle Ron? He'd go, oh, we're just looking at the clouds, full of looking at the clouds and the birds and the bushes. And he'd be absolutely happy as Larry, absolutely happy as Larry, just looking at the birds and the clouds and the bushes and the twigs. Every now and then, every now and then, a little challenge has come his way, a little challenge. And Uncle Ron would always go, oh, fuck it. Now, I know that's Australian and slightly vulgar, but that actual policy is quite interesting, isn't it? If you think of all the challenges that come your way over the course of the day, you could say F it to about 80 percent of them, couldn't you? To create the space to focus on the 20 percent that actually matter. So my challenge to you in the health and safety industry is Effit Friday. And what that means is that you clear out your in-tray of all the 80% of stuff that's essentially nonsense and focus on the 20% that actually matters. So there's a key lesson there uh, from Uncle Ron. 
So connect, learn, be active, notice, get back, eat well, relax. The other thing I want to say about Uncle Ron is he was very good on his diet. He liked his vegetables. And the only time he used to leave the veranda during the day is to, to do a poo in his thunderbox or his dunny. So it was an outdoor toilet. He used to call it a thunderbox or a dunny. And occasionally, Uncle Ron would do an absolute beauty. And he'd call me over. He'd go, Philip, have a look at this. I've done a golden grogan. And a golden grogan would coil twice around the pan and be pointed at both ends. Now, that's known as a number four on the Bristol stool chart of risk management. And that's a healthy poo, a Mr. Whippy. If they're a bit soft and raggedy or they're too pellety, you're not getting enough roughage and fluid in there. So that's the, the secret. If your bowels are healthy, probably the rest of you is healthy. So you've eaten well. How many of you actually relax? How many of you listen to this? Put your mind to bed to come off your phone, to deal with your emails, just to take half an hour to relax. Do you do that, James? Uh, unfortunately, Phil, I don't. Uh, learning to relax is a real problem for me. We're not men are not good at this. And so you, James, probably does it by relaxing by running. It's interesting, isn't it? Because you're, you're de-stressing whatever. So exercise is good for that. Uncle Ron, again, was a bit of a genius. He used to have a sitting room that was just for sitting. It had no screens in it. And he'd come in at the end of the day and he would talk about uh, the amazing view he'd seen, the bushes he'd seen, the twigs he'd counted, the funny joke the post he had told him, how much he loved Auntie Queenie the fabulous Golden Grogan he'd done that day. Uh, and he talked to himself and we used to think he was bonkers. We now know he was a genius because uh, he was practicing what we call positive psychology. Uh, so uh, he was um, accentuating the good things in his life, having gratitude for the good things in his life. Uh, and we know that actually, actually improves your mental health. Uh, I work with kids with severe fatigue who often, you know, they miss out on school and they miss out on socializing and they get really low in their mood. And one of the mums, rather amazingly, um, she actually bought her and her daughter some rose-tinted spectacles. They actually were rose-tinted spectacles. And at the end of the day, they'd put their rose-tinted spectacles on and they'd sit down and they'd say, well, we'll try and see the world through rose-tinted spectacles. I think that was probably what Boris Johnson was doing with his speech yesterday, accentuating all the positives and ignoring all the facts. Uh, but there is, it's interesting. You think, gosh, how ridiculously optimistic is that man? But optimists do tend to live longer. You know, realists and, and pessimists are, are living in the real world. And you'd be odd if you didn't get a little bit depressed and anxious occasionally. But the optimists are the ones who survive for some unfair reason. So a little bit of optimism is good. Uh, but in your industry, you've clearly got to risk manage your relaxation time. So you make sure you're not missing anything too good. And then sleep is interesting. We know uh, and the World Health Organization have just come up with this. Is the biggest cause of, of harm in the workplace is overwork and lack of sleep. We've known this in healthcare for ages. And yet, you know, when I trained as a junior doctor, we used to do 120 hour weeks. We do a continuous shift from 9 a.m. on a Friday to 5 p.m. on a Monday. And if it was busy, you'd barely get any sleep. And we would accept that as OK. Uh, we're much less accepting of that now. And there's a load of research now that shows that sleep, you know, there's a big battle at the moment in lifestyle medicine. So lifestyle medicine is stopping you falling in the river of illness. What's the most important thing? Is it exercise? Is it a healthy diet? Is it downtime and relaxation time? Is it sleep? So all these big pillars of preventative medicine are competing. Sleep is probably the neglected thing. We know that if you manage to get around eight hours sleep and you try to get routine, you try to go to bed at the same time and get up at the same time every day, including weekends, not easy if you're working shift work, not easy if you've got a big project on where you suddenly get a great idea at three o'clock in the morning and have to write it down. So sometimes you will be paying catch up, but generally that regular sleep is really important, not just for general immunity and general health, but in terms of creativity. So we know that people are more creative, they solve problems better, physically they're better. Usain Bolt used to have a kip in the afternoon before all his big races. Uh, and yet we take our phones to bed with us, the trouble with phones, of course, is as well as exciting us, they give off blue light unless you have them always on red mode, which I would recommend. Always have them on night shift. Uh, and uh, the blue light uh, stimulates your brain and releases cortisol, which blocks your melatonin, which means you can't get to sleep. So caffeine, we know, also blocks melatonin. So caffeine after midday is a bad idea. Alcohol, interestingly, disrupts your sleep even more than caffeine. Uh, so if you are going to drink, please do it in the mornings. Um, if anyone from the General Medical Council is listening to this, that was a joke. But it's interesting. Risk management is, you know, that ridiculous thing. You've just had a big meal and then you, you top it off with a, a, a strong coffee and a glass of port and it absolutely destroys your sleep and you get knock on effects. So it's in people who come off the caffeine or ease off the caffeine and ease off the alcohol, prioritise their sleep, feel a hell of a lot better. And they also tend to lose weight when we're tired and stressed and anxious. We tend to overeat. So all these things are feeding in. So. 
here am I living in beautiful northeast Somerset. Uh, my MP is Jacob rees mogg who's uh, an absolute delight, as you could imagine. But I am happy and privileged and live in a lovely place. And, you know, it's relatively easy for me to do my daily clangers. And I hope it's reasonably easy for you. Connect, learn, be active, notice, give back, eat well, relax, sleep. But if you're living with debt or depression or dementia or domestic abuse or long COVID or all these things, it becomes near impossible. So in terms of saving the NHS, we have to improve the health of the nation. And one way would be to guarantee clangers for all. We could go into school and teach clangers. We can go into care homes and teach clangers. Don't beat yourself up if you don't manage them all. But those pillars, fundamental pillars of preventative health should also be a joy. It should be a joy to connect with people around you. It should be a joy to keep your curiosity alive and to learn. It should be a joy to be physically and, and mentally active. It should be a joy to notice the beauty of the world around you, to give back to others, to eat food that is both nutritious and delicious, to relax gently and to sleep. So I'm coming up for 60. I've never been on the diet. I've never seen any sort of complementary therapist. Uh, I've never spent a night in hospital as a patient. Obviously, I have as a doctor. And all I do is clangers. And your clangers may be very different to my clangers. So the thing is, I'm not telling you you all have to do exactly the same clangers. Your lockdown clanger might be looking a bit like this. You might have put a little bit of extra on. Um, so that's how you stay out of the NHS. That's how you risk manage your own health is prioritizing your clangers, your family's clangers, the clangers in your community. So if you're lucky enough to be able to do these, you then broaden your circle of compassion to help others do those. So what do we then do if we need to use the NHS? So some of you may be rich and active and fit, but one in nine of you will be genetically predisposed to premature disease, whatever you do. So the genetic roulette wheel spins and some of us will get a cancer or an unpleasant neurological condition or an arthritis because it's written in our genes and there's nothing that we can do about it. Uh, others of us will just go through a tough time because uh, shit happens in all our lives. We can adjust the level, um, but those things will happen in all our lives. We know we're going to die and along the way we will lose loved ones, we will lose jobs, sudden things happen like car accidents, we are traumatised, etc. If you can reduce the emotional hits you take, that makes a big difference. So we know that a lot of your future health um, starts from fertilisation and probably pre-fertilisation. So if you're well prepared, you've taken your folic acid, you're uh, eating a good diet, you're not smoking, you've cut down on your alcohol prior uh, to getting pregnant as a woman, that will probably have a significant effect on baby's health and whole future health life chances. I'm just going to reflect quickly on my own health before we talk about risks in the NHS. This is my mum and dad. So my mum was uh, a teacher trainee at Homerton College in Cambridge back in the 50s. My dad was an Australian uh, chemist who got a scholarship to do a PhD at Cambridge. Very attractive uh, brunettes, extremely handsome, uh, almost like royalty. I would have thought looking at that, absolutely wonderful. They decide to spin the wheel of genetic roulette and out pops this little fella. Look at that. Look at that. Isn't that lovely? So that shows you there is always an element of chance. I was so large, my dad called me the 10 pound pom. Uh, I was born in the NHS, as many of you will have been, and I was born at home, as many of you will have been back in the 60s. Uh, and uh, the snow, in 1962, the snow was up to here. This little Welsh midwife came trudging through to deliver me. Uh, and as she tried to get me out in the early hours of New Year's Day morning, the cord was wrapped round the neck, obstetric emergency. So that tells you there's a lot of luck involved in health had to call out the local GP. Now, can you imagine what state the local GP was in in the early hours of New Year's Day morning, 1962? Dr. Dick came waddling through the shoulder high snow. He was quite posh. He was in his black tie, apparently. <laughs> he was a bit like Boris Johnson, uh, but mercifully competent. Um, and he managed to unfurl the cord uh, and deliver me. Hugely lucky. Had he not been able to get through, had the cord got stuck, I was born at home, very difficult backup, couldn't get to hospital, I'd have been in trouble. Uh, that same year, my mum was offered thalidomide, as many women were in the 60s, to help with morning sickness. sickness. To this day, my mum at 84 has very rarely taken a tablet. At 84, she vaults over gates and, uh, and has done her daily clangers and remained very healthy. Uh, so that was me. Uh, I was brought up in Australia. My dad took us back to Australia. This is me at seven, looking a bit better, I would say. Uh, I loved Australia. I loved being outdoors. Um, uh, I was particularly good at cheating, as many Australians are. Uh, I used to win swimming competitions by diving in on get set. Uh, I figured if you dived in on take your marks, you was, you'd get caught. But at seven, I would dive in just before the go, give myself half a second. And Australian love cheats. So as, long as, you, as long as you win, they don't really mind. 
Uh, so I won my way into probably the highest quality sports event I've ever done. I won my way into a swimming championship at BT Park, the big Olympic pool in Perth. Uh, on Sunday, November the 30th, I was very, very excited. And I got home and my mum scooped me up and my brother up and said, I've got some very sad news for you. I'm afraid your dad has had a heart attack and he's died. So dad was 38. He was captain of all Australian University's basketball team. He could leap off the ground as if gravity didn't apply to him. Uh, to this day, I can't understand his PhD, and he died at 38 of a heart attack. Um, our life changed completely because my mum was English. We moved from Western Australia, beautiful outdoor existence, to Watford, uh, where my mum's parents lived. So that was quite a change. Uh, and uh, I can remember slightly vexing about heart attacks and whether there was a genetic risk in the Hammond family for heart attacks and whether my heart was going to stop at 38 or indeed whether there was only so many human beats left in a human heart and I should slow down rather than speed up to not to use them all up. So that was the sort of childish thinking that went through my mind. Uh, I was a bit ginger uh, growing up, as you can say, it's much ginger than I am now. And then, of course, puberty struck. Uh, very lucky for me. And look at this little fella. Isn't that lovely? I had like the uh, everyone had that sort of haircut back then, even when James uh, Pomeroy had hair, he had a haircut like that. And the National Health Spectacles that looked like a sea slug had fallen asleep on my eyebrows. Uh, very good at science. Uh, my brother was blonde and beautiful, favourite child. He was off with the girls all the time. I was very good at science, got my science A-levels, uh, decided to study medicine, I think partly to try and stop myself dying of a heart attack at 38, uh, but also to stop other people. I remember Dame Cicely Saunders, founder of the hospice movement, came to speak at my school. And she said, the joy of being human is to be humane and everybody deserves a decent death. Now, this is back in the 70s. She showed, those old, she showed old cine films of people dying and having fun at her hospice and laughing and then having decent pain-free deaths. And I thought, actually, that's I want to be a doctor. Uh, so this was um, me as a junior doctor dropping the baby. My big eye-opener as a junior doctor is that I thought the NHS wasn't safe. Uh, we didn't have enough junior doctors. I was working 120 hours a week. The first thing I did nearly to kill a patient was as a fourth year medical student at St Thomas's Hospital I was allowed to act up as a locum uh, which meant I, I behaved as a house officer because the house officer was on holiday and I was called in the middle of the night to recite somebody's drip on the kidney transplant ward and now when people are having kidney transplants they're often having dialysis so they have these shunts put into their arms so you have to try and put the drips into a tiny little vein on the back of the hand I'd never done it before it was three o'clock in the morning there was nobody to show me so I had to practice and I put the tourniquet on so the veins really bulged out and I managed to put the drip in and get a flashback of blood. And then I went to flush it through with a little bottle of saline to stop it blocking up. And by mistake, I picked up a little bottle of potassium. That's an identical bottle and they were stored next to each other on the shelf. So very hard to tell them apart. Three o'clock in the morning, my responsibility, I should read the labeling properly, but I didn't. I loaded my syringe up with potassium. I flushed the drip through. Fortunately, uh, I was so appalling that I didn't have the drip in properly because if I had done, it would have stopped this woman's heart and she would have died very quickly with an intravenous potassium injection. But the drip was tissued, so it went into her tissues, which hurt her. She pulled her hand back and I went, oh dear, you must be allergic to saline because uh, I'd realised my mistake and covered it up. So that was 1980s. That was how we made mistakes. We covered them up. We burnt the notes. We buried the x-rays. We had lots of responsibility, but no accountability. There were no safe systems. There was no audit. There was no quality control. We were jolly good chaps doing our best in difficult circumstances. If you're working 120 hours a week, what do you expect? Now, I felt from a safety point of view that that wasn't acceptable. So I invited the Sunday Times in to film me during when I did obstetrics. I did an 81 hour shift. And I started raising concerns, saying, look, this isn't safe. You're making unsupervised, untrained junior doctors work 120 hours a week and do procedures they're not trained to do. And then rather unconventionally, I turned this into comedy. I went up to the Edinburgh Fringe and formed a comedy double act called Struck Off and Die. I went through a slightly plumper phase, it has to be said, uh, and started telling these stories of junior doctors making mistakes, killing patients when they were tired, burning the notes, burying the x-rays. Um, this was recorded up at the Edinburgh Fringe by Radio 4, who played highlights before the archers that got record number of complaints to the Broadcasting Standards Council, whose chair, then chair, William Rees Mogg, declared that this was inappropriate material for a comedy show. So laughing at junior doctors' fatal mistakes was considered inappropriate. Uh, and I would tell stories of every hospital I worked in would have a dodgy surgeon called Butcher Bates or Chopper Charlton. There was one up north known as the Terminator. 
And nobody blew the whistle because everybody needed a reference. So you can't blow the whistle on your senior consultant. The senior consultant would have given his life and his liver to the NHS. And he should have stepped down, but because he had a final salary pension scheme, he would have carried on till the very last to pick that up. And everyone in the hospital wouldn't send their mum or probably their dog to him, but he carried on operating. This was a sort of a fairly well-known thing. And I felt that was inappropriate. Uh, but thanks to my complaints to the BBC, they invited me to the BBC Radio Light Entertainment Christmas Party, where I spotted Ian Hislop, the new editor of Private Eye. I followed him into the toilet. And I said, can I have a column in Private Eye? And he said, do you mind not standing so close to me? Um, and I emerged as Private Eye's medical correspondent in 1991. So I've been doing that for 30 years. And initially, I wrote about how unsafe the NHS was on the front line because of the pressures on junior doctors and nurses. But at that same time, there was a very brave anaesthetist in uh, Bristol called Steve Bolson, who was raising concerns that far too many babies were dying or suffering from brain damage at the Bristol Royal Infirmary in the 80s and early 90s. Uh, and uh, I met him, I got his confidential audit that showed comparatively, it was clear that Bristol was a significant outlier. Everybody inside the specialty knew that your chances of a baby dying or brain, brain damage was much higher in Bristol. And yet no parents knew that. And to me, I felt that was completely unacceptable. So I published this story in Private Eye, but in fairly darkly satirical terms under a pseudonym. So Ian insisted I write under the pseudonym MD because professionals who'd written for Private Eye in the past under their own name had been absolutely crucified. So he said, you have to write under a pseudonym. But I very clearly said, don't write, don't have your kids operated on in Bristol. And I quoted junior doctors I knew who worked on the unit who referred to it as the killing fields and the departure lounge. I then went up to the Edinburgh Fringe and told this story, which the BBC again recorded, uh, and a room full of medics laughed. So this is interesting. When stuff happens in medicine, well, people talk about the gallows humour in the NHS and the frontline services, and you do use gallows humour to cope. But my argument was that if you displaced your emotions into satire, it stops you from addressing the problem. So you can just say, oh, that surgeon's called Butcher Bates or the Terminator. I won't send my kids to him, but blur, I'll park it over there. But actually, far more difficult is how do you raise concerns? The story of Bristol is interesting because I raised concerns in 1992 in Private Eye. Uh, the Trust were clearly aware, and we now know because of the public inquiry, that these Private Eye articles went right up to the Department of Health, and yet operations carried on until 1995, when Steve Bolson got so distressed that he went public in the Telegraph, and when the mainstream media had picked it up, uh, suddenly things happened. A public inquiry was announced, and it became what was then the largest public inquiry in British history. Uh, this is me about to give evidence at it. So uh, when my kids were looking through photos of me to make a little montage for my birthday, they came across this one and said, Dad, did you have cancer when you were younger? This is what the stress of a public inquiry does to you. So I was 38 at this stage. I was the same age that my dad was when he'd had a heart attack. And it was the most stressful thing I've ever done, partly because, you know, if you blow the whistle on your own profession under a pseudonym in a satirical magazine, you might get away with it. But I openly admitted that it was me. I said, you have to be accountable for what you'd written. And had I got it wrong, had I wrongly slandered or libeled the Bristol surgeons, and in fact, their results were no worse than anyone else's, that would be my career over, without a doubt. Fortunately, the statisticians agreed that you were far more likely to die after complex surgery in Bristol. At least three dozen babies had died, probably avoidably. They didn't really look into the brain damage. Uh, but I then became, I would say, untrusted by my profession. So although I've always supported the NHS, I've been unafraid to dish the dirt on what I call safety concerns. This was supposed to be the watershed moment. So this was the moment when the NHS started putting in quality control. We started doing audit and actually said, you're going to have to risk stratify your audit and you're going to have to put it in the public domain so patients can make informed choices. They still don't, because if you've got heart, heart attack and you're due to have heart surgery or whatever, you're just thankful for the first expert who comes your way. So relatively few people using the NHS will risk stratify and very few will say to a surgeon, how many of these operations do you do? Will you be doing the operation or will it be outsourced to a junior doctor? Uh, what are your results? How do they compare to the national average, et cetera? Very few people do that. And that's one reason why we have such patchy outcomes right across the NHS, because it's not consumerist. Patients don't behave as consumerists. They're too frightened to put the system to the test. They think if they complain, they'll then get bad treatment. So for all that I've done in private, I thinking this would be the difference. Has it made a difference? I don't know. 
We're still very understaffed. As a rich nation, we put relatively little into healthcare and social care. And in essence, you get the services you deserve. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily the fault of the structure of the NHS. I think it's more about how we staff it. But I think we're a long way from safety. What's interesting about this, though, is that it took three and a half years for a whole team of statisticians to figure out how many excess deaths occurred in a child heart surgery unit over a given period. Imagine the level of complexity that the public inquiry into the pandemic is going to go through. So they're going to look at what we could have done, what we did do, how many deaths we might have avoided, how many deaths we might have caused by lockdown, what could have happened if we'd locked down earlier and come out earlier, etc. So there are lots of different options. I reckon that will take them five years, possibly 10. It is of such staggering complexity. Who can we compare ourselves to? Well, yes, New Zealand shut down early. It's a tiny island. We're 15 times the size of that. And now, because it didn't vaccinate quickly, it's having to give up its zero COVID pledge. But we can't really compare ourselves to New Zealand. Can we compare ourselves to Germany? Can we compare ourselves to France? Or do we just have to benchmark ourselves? So I don't quite know what the public inquiry will say, uh, but my fear is that it will be delayed and delayed and delayed. So that the pattern of public inquiries, political public inquiries, is that they tend to delay them until the party is replaced, in power is replaced. So the Bristol uh, Heart Inquiry happened under the Conservatives, well, the Bristol disaster unfolded under the Conservatives' watch, but it wasn't until Labour came in that they ordered a public inquiry. They set up the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence, the Care Quality Commission, etc. Mid-Staffordshire then happened under Labour's watch. So this was interesting again. This was uh, Labour's obsession with a target-driven NHS where people wanted to become foundation trusts. So the idea was that you would have local autonomy if you could show that you could balance your books more than anything else. And the overriding imperative for trust became balancing the books. And mid-staffs became that example. They were desperate to become a foundation trust, which would give them more autonomy to how to spend their money. But to do that and to balance the books, they understaffed their wards in the emergency department and the medical wards. And it meant that a lot of people died um, avoidably because they didn't get a decent standard of care. Uh, and people knew that that was going on. Once again, people blew the whistle. Once again, they were ignored and ostracized. And perhaps the most depressing thing for me out of the Mid-Staffordshire scandal is that when the public inquiry printed its results, you could have cut and pasted most of the recommendations from the Bristol inquiry. They said exactly the same thing. They said the NHS is understaffed. And we don't have safe staffing levels. We don't encourage people to speak up. We have some good safe systems. We've done better. We're better at managing MRSA and Clostridium difficile and hospital acquired infections. So there are some small instances where we've done a brilliant job but we don't have the staff on the ground to have the capacity to deal with the demand. And when things go wrong, people just say, well, shit, that's just the way it is. So they, they, they become desensitized to the suffering around them. And it was almost identical. So that was mid staffs. We've also had a number of maternity scandals. Um, this is the most dangerous time of your life, obviously, other than your death, is your birth. You know, if you want to affect people's future life chances, they've got to have a really good time in the womb and a really safe birth. And yet we're again desperately short of midwives. But because we've suddenly moved to a culture of patient safety, so since Bristol, even the NHS talks about zero harm. But of course, that's a nonsense. First, do no harm is the biggest nonsense ever in medicine. Everything we do in medicine has the potential to cause harm. If I told James that he had erectile dysfunction, even if he didn't, psychologically, that might give him erectile dysfunction. Telling people they have high blood pressure, just the label of high blood pressure, for some people means they stop playing sport, they stop having sex, they stop doing things they enjoy because they're worried about having a stroke. So the notion that there was ever zero harm in healthcare is a nonsense. And I know in your industries, you're obsessed, some of you, with zero harm. The reason we're having this conference online, interestingly, is because your industries are still very, very safety conscious. So three weeks ago, I did the first face-to-face -face medical conference in Manchester for orthodontists, 700 orthodontists in the Midland Hotel, where the Conservative Party conference partly has been. They were all double vaxxed and they all took lateral flow tests. There were no masks at all indoors, apart from one or two people who wanted to wear one. And then they all went to the Albert Hall in Manchester for a big party afterwards. So that's one way of managing risk. They said, this is the best we can do. Double jab vax, get on, enjoy yourself. I then went to Leeds for a medical lecture where the students were supposed to be there in attendance, but the medical school got cold feet at the last minute. And so all the students had to be online. And I had 15 people 
socially distanced in a lecture theatre for 550. I mean, it was all wearing masks. So that was another way of doing it. Uh, and then, of course, yours, where you're all doing it online. And it shows differences in appetite for risk uh, in amongst different industries. Who is to say what the right one is? If you look at the evidence on coronavirus, we say following the science. But how do you follow the science when there is no science? There is no evidence base for lockdown. There is no evidence base. The mask research, to be honest, is full of holes. And it's an evolving virus that we haven't seen before. So actually, you can't follow the science when there is no science to follow. All our modelling was based on an influenza pandemic. Uh, and this virus behaves in a very different way. So actually, it's about how you manage uncertainty in real time and how you change direction. It means, as science always does, forming a hypothesis, then trying to prove yourself wrong and then acting in real time on the results if you are wrong and need to change direction. And science embraces that and health and safety embraces that, but politics doesn't. Politicians are hopeless at saying in real time, oh, hang on, we've made a mistake here. Remember Boris Johnson at the very start saying, well, I went into hospitals and you'd be pleased to hear, I shook hands with everyone there and I didn't wear a mask. And a few days later, he was in intensive care with coronavirus. Um, it's fine to make mistakes. Of course it's fine. You know, if you're naturally an optimist and a cheerleader and you might take insane risks in your personal life, it's perhaps unsurprising that you pick up COVID. But it's actually being able to admit in real time that you've made uh, mistakes. And the issue again, that came back for the NHS and social care is that we didn't have the capacity to cope, as, as no country did, but we had less capacity. So we have fewer intensive care beds, fewer intensive care nurses, less care home capacity, because we put significantly less into our health service. We have 2.8 uh, doctors per uh, thousand of the population, a million of the population, and the, the EU has, I think, 3.5. So we have significantly less doctors per head of the population than other carers. And so we didn't have the capacity to cope and we coped pretty much by coming a COVID service. So everything was dedicated to COVID. We built all these Nightingale hospitals, remembered a huge fanfare. It's amazing, just like Wuhan. In Wuhan, they stuck up a hospital in three days. So we're gonna do it in the NHS and all amazing fanfare. And we hardly used them because we didn't have the staff. We couldn't transfer people out there because all the staff were tied up in NHS hospitals. We could have used them for old style fever hospitals. So people who were relatively well, that had COVID but did need intensive care, we could have just put them in the fever hospitals and protected their families because the Chinese realized that most spread occurs at home. If you've got somebody in your home who's got COVID and you're in a, in a, a crowded home where maybe two or three generations of your family live, they're all gonna get COVID. So poorer populations were two to three times more likely to get COVID and to be harmed by COVID, uh, partly because they have more cramped living conditions, partly because they're poor and they need to get out and work and do frontline staff and uh, work and they weren't protected. So there were all sorts of reasons. In essence, I would say um, the pandemic has almost been like a barium meal. It's been like a big test for existing inequalities. It's just widened the equalities we knew that were already there. We already know that me as a relatively wealthy person will have 20 more years without disease uh, and 10 more years of life expectancy than somebody who's very poor. And those inequalities have already been widened. And it is interesting because what Boris Johnson is saying when he says he wants to level up, he says he wants to level the risk up. Yeah. And if he wants to level the risk up, then that's going to start from the moment sperm meets egg. It's going to start with having really good antenatal care. It's also going to start with reintroducing things like Sure Start, where parents are given really good advice on diet and nutrition and managing their mood and anger, because we know that if kids are treated cruelly in their early lives, they very rarely discover that recover. So all of these complex things come into there. I would say individually, the NHS manages risk really well. So I've just done the BMJ Awards, where we awarded um, elements of amazing care right throughout the pandemic, little islands of excellence where people manage stuff. We did some of the best research in the world in the NHS because we have this large organization. We did something called the recovery trial, which showed us very quickly using large randomized control trials, which drugs worked and which didn't. And we implemented them in record time. We used to say it takes 10 years for evidence to reach the front line. We did this really fast. Our vaccine research was amazing. So the stuff, we have the people in the NHS doing brilliant stuff. What we don't have is the staff. Uh, we have some good safety systems, but we don't have sufficient staff in health and social care to cope with the demands. So we have GPs in little 10 minute consultations managing incredibly complex risk. Uh, uh, you'll have an elderly person with five comorbidities, breathlessness, loneliness, et cetera, and you're supposed to get through that and manage that safely in 10 minutes. And because the emphasis now is on health and safety, a lot of doctors and NHS staff are using that as an excuse to walk away from the job. 
So they're saying, I can't safely deliver frontline care now, as I'm told to do. I'm worried of being hang out to dry if I don't. So I'd rather not do the job. So it's making the care crisis even harder. So half grounds for optimism. But my message still is do whatever you can to do your clangers and to help others do this to avoid getting sick in the first place. The healthiest systems in the world see any emergency hospital admission uh, as a failure. They do everything they can in their communities, from children to care homes, to invest in community care, because hospital care is unbelievably risky and unbelievably expensive. And so the most coordinated joined up systems stop you going into hospital in the first place. So you can do that as an individual, you can do that as your family, you can do that within your community. Uh, and then we need some state intervention to help us stay out of hospital in the first place. So those are my thoughts on how we manage risk. I see uh, uh, Douglas has popped up again there. So I guess my hour is up. Uh, your clangers, I will give you a clangers card to take away with you to send to Douglas. The other quick acronym I'll give you is the, how we manage informed consent if we have the time in the NHS. Uh, we use the acronym BROMS and it stands when I, where you want to know whether a drug works for you. We talk about benefits, risks, alternatives, unknowns, really important in a pandemic. What if we did nothing? And what's our safety net if it doesn't work? Benefits, risks, alternatives, unknowns. What if we did nothing? What's the safety net? And that's a really good model that most doctors are taught and embrace, but we just don't have time to do it in five minutes in a GP consultation. So that's the issue. Informed consent about risks, which is fundamental to ethical healthcare, is impossible and unworkable in the current climate. So thanks for listening. And if you have any questions or an interesting lump you want to show me on the camera, I know James just says that he's he looks roughly the same age as his left testicle, but he's a bit worried about the right one. Well, we can have a little private conversation at any stage. Oh, he's laughing now. Good. That could have gone Well, be, being married to a theatre nurse, there's but many I'm, of what you've said is it resonates with me. You don't need me then. You don't need me. <laughs> anyway, Douglas, any questions from anyone? Because I can't see questions popping up or anything you want yeah. to ask me. Uh, thanks, thanks, for, thanks very much, Bill, for that. That's uh, absolutely wonderful. Um, I'd... Uh, 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 yeah, just just extend it out then to to anyone here who would uh, like to ask if you can just turn your mic on and, and ideally as well stick your camera on so that uh, at least Bill can f uh, feel that there's uh, there's more here than, than just James. <laughs> anyone uh, want to uh, uh, ask something of Phil? Yes, uh, James. Then okay, then go on. There we go. I'll, I'll start us off. Um, Phil, I'm I'm really intrigued by so much of what you've said, but I'll just start with one if I can. Um, so one of the things that strikes me uh, being married to, to a lot of people who work in the NHS is the language of how we talk about risk. So my wife talks a lot about complications, and this is relevant because in safety, we're increasingly talking about complexity. How much do you think the language frames how we think about safety and particularly in your area of patient safety and errors? It is interesting, isn't it? I mean, we use a lot of military metaphors in healthcare as well. I mean, everything is a battle, a fight against cancer. And it, it's rather bizarre, isn't it, that they've, uh, I think the government have just introduced something called General Messenger, who's going to come in from the Marines and lead a leadership review into the NHS as if, you know, I don't know what we can learn from the military, but it is interesting. Yes, I think language is important. Um, and the trouble is that in my life, the NHS was built on euphemism. It sounds unbelievable, but in the 80s, when I qualified, we routinely wouldn't tell people the truth about their diagnosis. So we wouldn't actually tell people if they, a third of people, we didn't tell them if they had cancer. We'd often not tell them if they had dementia or motor neuron disease or multiple sclerosis, because in that rather benign paternalistic way, we thought they'd be better off not knowing. So we'd use euphemisms, which amuses me because Boris Johnson uses one of the common euphemisms, which means it'll get a little worse before it gets a little better, which in essence meant you're going to die. Uh, and you could have cancer, but we could say you've got a bit of a lump down below or you've got a bit of a warty growth on the liver. So the, the first th thing that's changed in my lifetime is we've actually moved to telling people the truth. It's then how, how you frame uh, that information. So people don't like talking about complications. And it's interesting that you, you try and have this com conversation about informed consent with people and you talk about complications and risks and some people don't like to hear it when they're ill. So the way that we accept risks when we're feeling completely well and the way that you accept risks when you're ill are different. And some people, when they're ill, they say, I just want you to do your best or I just want you to do what you do for your mum or your daughter. I, I don't want all this information buzzing around in my head. And others are unbelievably assertive in the way that they manage risk and understand it. So the biggest change in the area that I worked, I worked in sexual health medicine and 
HIV, as you may know, in my era when we grew up, killed loads of young men, uh, not just gay men, but men and uh, women in all walks of life, uh, and was a, a fairly early death sentence. Now it's a little bit like having high blood pressure. Uh, and one of the reasons it's changed is that patients in that particular group were really assertive. So I would work in clinics and patients would read the latest article in the New England Journal of Medicine or the, the British Medical Journal. And they'd want to discuss risk and complication and what it meant in quite a lot of detail. Um, and that actually made us raise our game. And yes, drug companies had to invest. And yes, we had to do the research. But now we have drugs. We can now stop you. You can have pre-exposure prophylaxis, which means even if you have unprotected sex, you're not going to pick up HIV. We can have post-exposure prophylaxis, which means if something goes wrong or your condom break, we can stop you getting it. We can stop HIV being passed on down to babies. Huge stuff. And yes, it's partly the drug industry, but it's also the pressure. If you talk about what's happened in this pandemic, there are loads of armchair experts, some of whom, to be honest, are really quite good tweeting and trying to analyze risk and complexity. And there are people from all walks of industry who have fed into the bucket saying, well, let's just not make this about COVID. Let's consider uh, lockdown harms and all the other complexity of harms going on. So I actually think it's we're, we're having a more grown up conversation about complexity and complication of risk, not just in the NHS, but in society in large because of the pandemic. But we've never had an illness where somebody's come on the news every single day for 18 months and talked about deaths just from one condition. And that's also going to create a huge amount of anxiety. So some people will still be wearing masks long after perhaps they need to. Some are still frightened to go outdoors because created huge. So, yeah, it's really interesting. It's, it's the message and how you deliver the message. And it's that balance between informed consent and causing people to be incredibly anxious. Lovely. Douglas, anyone else going to ask me something? Anyone else want to uh, uh, speak with Phil? He'll, the doctor will see you now. <laughs> I can't believe that they're all. Go on, Fiona. <clears throat> yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Oh, I sorry, we've got Anthony. Anthony. Yes, Anthony. Yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm a safety lead for an NHS mental health organisation in the northeast, and I'd just be really interested in your view about the traditional five by five risk matrix and how difficult that is for clinicians to comprehend and understand. So in the traditional words of risk management, we'll manage our risks by five by five, likelihood and consequence. And that never sits well with clinicians, and I absolutely understand that because of dynamic risk when you're planning care. Well, that's interesting. So tell me, what, where, how do you explain it to them? When you say it doesn't sit well with them, how do you try and get them on board? I guess we do a lot of training, a lot of education. They understand when it's their corporate processes and things like that, about whether staff are trained or untrained and things like that, and the likelihood of the risk for that. But when it comes down to individual patient care planning, they really struggle with that. And I guess it's that kind of centralised approach. So when you're trained as a health and safety professional, that's what's ingrained in you about risk management and risk understanding. Um, but it is interesting, the modern healthcare services, now we talk about risk appetite, what level of risk we're willing to accept in an organisation. Yeah, I I think it's really, I mean, doctors are notoriously hard to train. They always do, when we have this big issue with uh, hospital acquired infections, the people who are often worst at washing their hands, even though there was high levels of MRSA and C. diff and whatever, were doctors and they were Part of that, I think, might be the arrogance of doctors, this idea that you're a doctor, you're a bit special or something other, you don't need to play by the rules. When we tried to make people go bare below the elbows, doctors would say, well, show me the randomised control trials. It's a little bit by masks. I mean, part of masks is showing that you give a shit, even if the evidence is still being collected. And it was the same with bare below the elbows. I think you need to... You need to convince, it's really difficult, you need to lead by example that convinces them. So this is an example of using a particular matrix or a particular strategy that actually delivered improvements in healthcare. So they're very evidence driven in that way. But I, I, I yeah, I think it's really interesting. I think doc doctors are incredibly difficult to manage. Um, and yes, me challenge over the last 37 years over seeing instant systems for NHS organisations that are the least likely to report an instant through a corporate system as well. Yes, and that's, yeah, that's true. And part of that is fear of being hung out to dry. There was certainly a different culture between doctors and nurses. So nurses often do get hung out to dry if they make a mistake and doctors often get away with it. And if you take it, I mean, there was a the example of Hadiza Gawababa, who was a junior paediatrician in Leicester who came back from maternity leave 
Her consultant wasn't even in the hospital. She didn't receive any induction at all, was suddenly on call on her first day, managing complex conditions on four floors of a hospital and was delayed in making a diagnosis of sepsis, which is very hard to make anyway. And the child very sadly died. And she was absolutely hung out to dry, both by the GMC and her hospital, even though it should have been consultant-led care. And she discussed it with a consultant, et cetera, et cetera. So we're still, although we say we're going to try and move away from fear and blame, we really struggle to do that. And I think that's the issue in the NHS is that people fear if they admit stuff, they won't be rewarded in the same way as you are in the airline industry or other industries. They still feel that they'll be blamed. I don't think Sajid Javid has helped us because he's just said, we're putting all this money into the NHS and if people don't deliver, we're going to sack them. And that will just rekindle the idea of um, fear and blame. I think the other thing coming in, what James said, is that simplistic targets, Labour tried simplistic targets. So they told people, unless we have 96 people in A&E seen within four hours, you're a failure uh, and we might sack you. And A, people fiddled their targets. So there was a loads of people fiddling waiting lists and fiddling targets. But the clinician said, this is more complicated. We may have this person who's been waiting four hours, but this person who needs to be seen immediately because they've got acute asthma. You're telling me to prioritise the bloke with the splinter. I don't agree with this. So the other reason to get doctors on board is to say, look, we want you to follow this matrix or whatever, wherever possible. But if you divert from it, we want you to be able to explain why. So as a clinician making your own decisions and being accountable in the front line, you can use our safety mechanisms. But if you divert from the guidance or the matrix, you have to justify why and explain to me, but not in a blamey way. We all want to learn why you felt in this particular instance it wasn't appropriate to do that. But yeah. I think the fact that we don't report the instance in the first place says it all, because if you don't report, you can't learn. End of story. So thank you for that, uh, Anthony. Thanks, Anthony. Yep. Um, time for one more. Anyone else want to uh, uh, take a hold of the mic? Feel free. Do, 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 do. All right, well, can I, in that case, yeah. plug my excellent book? Look at that. Oh, it's <laughs> the, like that. You've, you've twitted me. The, so... Dr. Hammond's COVID casebook, all my private eye columns up to the end of Matt Hancock uh, are available. So from the beginning of the pandemic, the end of Matt, there'll probably be a second one. The only reason I'm plugging it, um, I quite like it because I wrote it in real time. So what's interesting is I honestly wrote it in real time and tried to balance the risk. So it won't all be correct. It's just my honest and fairly broad appraisal without any political agenda. Um, I have got really good contacts. So I've got lots of really good experts. And my message actually from the pandemic is no expert has got this completely right. The more certain someone is about the pandemic, the less you should trust them. When you There's a great saying, when you've seen one pandemic, you've seen one pandemic. Uh, and this is different. And influenza may be our next pandemic and we may have to manage it differently. But a lot of this is about managing risk and uncertainty in real time and looking at the sheer breadth of it. You know, Instead of just suddenly saying, oh, we're going to become a COVID service. Well, what's happened to all those undiagnosed cancers and other things as well? So if you fancy a treat, it's also got cartoons in it, which is very unlike your normal thing. And if you can't wait to the public inquiry, it's only $9.99 or cheaper on some of those websites for big companies that don't pay much tax. Uh, so entirely up to you. But uh, that's all I'll say. But I will send Douglas a clangers card because teach your kids clangers. Just have a little think every day about your daily clangers because uh, I find it very useful. I teach in schools and, and care homes too, as well as in my NHS work. It's a very useful way of risk managing your own health and enjoying it at the same time. Thank you. And I think your and I think your your bonds model as well is is a great one. That's instantly benefits, transparent. Benefits, that. risks, alternatives, unknowns. What if we do nothing? What's our safety net if it doesn't work? Broads. There you go. Well, you can have that one for free. That's a bonus. Two for the thank price. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Phil. Thank you very much for.